Yeah. Thanks a lot. It feels, uh, feels kind of awkward to be part of a lottery. Uh, not as participant, but actually as a prize. Yeah, but that's what we do at Project A to support our portfolio companies. Yeah, give everything that we have, including me. So, um, I'm going to talk for the next uh, 20 minutes, I try, uh, at least, about um, how we see at least customer acquisition and customer retention merges um, a little bit in, in certain regards. And there are certain reasons for that to happen. Um, and there will also be the possibility to, to ask some questions later on. Uh, we at least uh, to try to do that for like 10 minutes. So, but you can also interrupt me, uh, so don't be shy. If you have any question that you feel is relevant for the audience, just, just interrupt me also um, uh, in the middle. Uh, just to give you um, um, a hint on why I think or why we think it's important um, that customer acquisition or what, what supports basically customer acquisition and customer retention merging in a certain sense. Um, there's some factors that I talked a lot about, you know, the platforms becoming more relevant. That's why you need more customer relationship or stable customer relationships to be uh, successful or to, to have a structurally viable business model. I think that that is, I think, fully understood by now, yeah, because I think the chance to build a first order profitable business um, in, in today's internet world is, is um, more and more unlikely. So you need repeat purchase uh, or you need repeat customers and stable customer relationships. I think um, uh, that, that's, that, that's one thing. And I think another factor that has really become more relevant why we think these things will merge is um, the prevalence of uh, data privacy. Yeah? So I think GDPR was just the start, and I think uh, first-party data um, that you generated yourself um, and that you not own, but that you've generated yourself with the users that interact with you. I mean, the question is who owns the data will be probably one of the most interesting over the next couple of years, but at least the first-party data, uh, you have the highest chance that you will be able to do most things with them also uh, in the next couple of years if you have the right kind of consent. Yeah? So uh, the, it's, it's pretty clear that the relevance of third-party data will not come back. Yeah? So first-party data is really the thing to concentrate on because no politician at all will gain any kind of uh, uh, popularity in any kind of election if they, vo if they basically propagate uh, a, a freer use of data. Yeah, that's just simply not how you can win elections. And that's why I think we all have to deal with um, the situation that um, the, um, uh, the kind of consensus mechanisms that have been put in place will definitely stay that way um, and very likely will become more strict, yeah? whether we like that or not. I think that's, that's just the, the, the situation. And, and um, so the relevance of first-party data becomes more and more relevant, and I think that's also changing the role of CRM in a certain way, yeah? because obviously people that are involved in CRM are the people that generate first-party data. Yeah? So, um, and I think um, if, you, if you also look at programmatic advertising, which I guess a lot of you are not really focusing on right now because it's user acquisition, the relevance of first-party data or products and data products and targeting audiences based on this first-party data is getting higher and higher. Yeah? So think look-alike audiences, similar audiences, etc. So something that probably most of you have dealt with on Facebook or have, have gotten to know on Facebook. That's definitely something that will um, also be more relevant outside of Facebook or off uh, Facebook and off Google. Um, so, and that's why I think if you look at current marketing departments today, you often have a complete separation between the CRM teams and the user acquisition teams. And I think that's not a good future uh, forward-looking uh, setup because if CRM is the best generator of first-party data, obviously these teams have to rethink how they actually work together. And there are cer certain um, um, companies where you already see that happening, yeah, where the CRM teams have become active data providers for the customer acquisition teams. And I think as long as you're just on Facebook or just on Google, it's not so relevant. Yeah? But I think also if you think three, four, five years ahead, um, the shift from TV budgets into Facebook and Instagram is still not uh, basically done 100%. Yeah? So there's still TV still gets more budget than they should. 
in the sense, if you, if you uh, historically look at which channel gets what budget, it always tends to be that, which makes complete sense, the percent in audience share and the percent in budget more or less goes hand in hand or goes in line, which makes an awful lot of sense. Yeah? You want to, want to be where the, where the audience is, so you spend the money where the audience is. Um, but um, obviously that always lags behind a little bit and print gets more money than they should. Yeah? I think that's a no-brainer that that will go away. And then TV gets more money than they should. And if that changes, and it will, the money, where should it go? It will very likely go into Facebook. Um, and it will probably also go, and that's also quite interesting, it will go into Amazon. I don't know who has probably has been aware of that. Amazon already has a $10 billion, $12 billion, nobody knows 100%, $12 billion advertising business. Yeah? And every new dollar that shifts digital, 80 cents of that go to Facebook and Google, and more and more of that go to Amazon. So what does it mean? The likelihood, and, and at the same time, the reach that Facebook generates grows slower than the budget going into Facebook. Yeah? So it will become more expensive. That's, that's just the pure logic. So I can only recommend to anybody in this room that you start to think about how to build first-party data assets, very likely in the CRM arena, that you will then be able to use also for customer acquisition. So obviously you can also do it on Facebook with similar audience or custom audiences and then similar look-alike audiences based on Facebook. But I can only highly recommend that you also get to know and build up the competence of how to do that outside of Facebook. Yeah? The problematic thing about this is on Facebook, building look-alike audiences is quite easy. Yeah? Anybody can do that if you're not completely stupid. Doing this outside of Facebook is obviously a lot more difficult for many reasons. First of all, the basis to build look-alike audiences are a lot smaller, yeah? so that's, that's a big problem. So your quality, the natural quality of your look-alike audiences off Facebook will always be worse because unfortunately the first party data that you have, normally if you are a normal e-com business or travel business or whatever, the normal or the, the, the average quality is lower. So the chance that your look-alike audiences perform as well as they do on Facebook is not that high, especially also uh, reaching a good campaign performance off-page of, or, off or not within the Facebook universe but outside the Facebook universe is obviously more difficult because a lot of the complexity that Facebook solves under the hood or Google solves under the hood, you have to solve yourself. Yeah? Because if you deal with AppNexus or if you deal with AdForm or if you do deal with the, the Google RTA suite, all of them are very performant in the way that they work, but they uh, require a lot more competence. And I think that's, that's a thing that you need to think about and also that CRM uh, people should think about. Because I think if you want to maximize your impact in the organization as somebody that's responsible for CRM, I think thinking about how you can support customer acquisition is, is a key thing. And you can start, obviously, with building first-party data that you would then intelligently use on Facebook. I think that's the first step. But then you should think about how you move beyond this. And I think that's just a thought that we wanted to um, give, <clears throat> or I wanted to pass on to you. Just talking a little bit about what that means. So going actually into the slides. I'm still on the first slide. That's always my problem. <laughs> um, just talking, just talking really quickly about just about Project A, but then I'm, um, I'm done. We are a venture capital firm here in, in Berlin. We manage roughly 400 million euros right now. That's, for Berlin, quite good. For international purposes, quite small. Um, so that's also a big problem we have in Germany, but we're not talking about that right now. That shouldn't be your problem, but it's definitely partially mine. We invest all over Europe, uh, increasingly also outside of Germany, uh, and increasingly, and that's probably also interesting for you, we have shifted our investment behavior quite a lot, not because I like it so much, from B2C to B2B, because we recognize more and more how difficult it is to build sustainable B2C businesses in Germany. Yeah, and that's a major investment criterion for us now. Do we think that on a five to 10 year time horizon, that's the time horizon we invest in, do we think that we can build sustainable B2C businesses 
Um, and obviously, we still believe that because we still do investments in that space, but we've definitely shifted more to B2B. Yeah? And exactly for the same reason why it makes sense to focus on um, uh, more on customer relationships vis-a-vis -vis customer acquisition. So that's probably the only thing that's really relevant for you here. We're also an investor in CrossEngage, just as a disclosure. One should always be transparent about this. So I talked about the initial situation already. I don't want to bore you with this. So I just want to you know, get you into this mode, first-party data. That's like going to be the key differentiator in the future. And then I want to show you this before going into what it actually means in practice. I think one thing that's really key to understand if you want to support customer acquisition based on um, the CRM data that you have. I always view um, or I always look at uh, the customer conversion behavior in terms of like in concentric circles. And I think that's a very good picture to look at. So what does this actually mean? This basically means that here in the inner circle, CRM, the natural conversion affinity of users is the highest, so it's the easiest to convert. Yeah? So the problem is the volume is obviously limited. Yeah? So if you don't want to stay an insignificant small company, you have to move to the outside concentric circles. Yeah? So ideally, to the audience targeting layer, and audience targeting could be done on TV, it could be done on Facebook, it could be done on Google, doesn't really matter. But the moment you move outside the CRM layer, the next layer is retargeting, the next layer is lookalike targeting, and then audience targeting. And audience targeting can be done on Facebook, can be done on YouTube, can be done on TV, it doesn't really matter. The, the, the truth is, and that's normally our experience, if you don't have a sufficient ROI on your activity in this layer or in this layer, it doesn't make sense to move to the outer layer. Yeah? Because our experience, and that's why I mean by you cannot really break the conversion affinity kind of concentric circle law. I mean, it's not a law by se, but I think it, it, it really, you, you see that over and over and over again. There's hardly any startup where retargeting doesn't work that can do profitable TV advertising or profitable audience targeting. And that's also the reason why you see less and less ProSieben, Sat1, Media for Equity deals in early stage startups, yeah, because they figured out you cannot make a startup that doesn't work in its core, you cannot save it by putting a lot of TV on it, yeah, because the money will just drain. Yeah? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. So you have to build a solid basis in the core concentric circles and then move to the outside. That's basically how it works. And I think that's very essential if you start to use your data for um, first or use first party data for customer ac acquisition activity. You start building a really good CRM stuff first, with a which a lot of people haven't done yet. Yeah, so we'll come to that in a minute. Then you start retargeting, then you start lookalike audiences, and then you move beyond that. Yeah, and it doesn't really matter on which platform you do that. I think the easiest to solve audience targeting right now is probably Facebook and Instagram. And the hardest thing to do is TV, yeah, because also the absolute amount of money you have to put in to find out whether it works is just so high. Yeah, but I think something like YouTube, etc., cetera, um, and that's probably also a good, uh, a good thing to test first. If YouTube doesn't work, it doesn't make sense to do a 500,000 euro TV campaign. That's at least our experience. But that's definitely something to have in mind. And there's a lot of people that don't do it this way, but they basically say, OK, this here works OK, but I st I'm, I'm going broader uh, sooner than I should. Coming out, OK, how can I actually merge custom acquisition and CRM, and what does it mean in practice? Um, what does it actually mean? I mean, if you look at the user funnel, you have the user attraction first, like new user attraction here. You have engagement then people probably purchase, you re-engage with them, and ideally there's a repeat purchase. And this is kind of the, the comfort zone for the MarTech stack. And what I would argue for is you need to widen that comfort zone and you need to deepen it. What do I mean by that? Deepening basically means you start often with email. I mean, if you look at most CRM programs today, they're still mainly email-based. Yeah? And I think what it definitely needs is that you deepen the CRM approach to other channels. I mean, the, the guys from Optilize are here. You need to send 
postcards, you need to use custom audience in a proper way, uh, you need to use mobile push notifications, browser notifications, etc. And whether you do that with cross-engage or uh, with other tools, it doesn't really matter, or you do it yourself. But I think be before you haven't really done a proper CRM approach that's multi-channel, I would not invest too much into going into audience targeting or the, the widening piece. So I think that's really the essential piece first. So deepen the usage of the MarTech stack. And then you start to widen it. And that's exactly what I said earlier. So you start with custom audiences. You build lookalike audiences on Facebook. And if you've done that or on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Facebook Messenger, uh, that's why, what I basically meant by that. And the moment that seems to work, then you start to move off Facebook and try to replicate the same thing off Facebook. And I think that's what I mean with widening. Um, the problem is, and I think that's essential to understand, um, so that's what I meant with the first action stream. So implement a CRM, user communication across all channels, email, mobile push, Facebook, browser, messenger, etc., and define a decent logic there. The next thing that you do is gradually try to move towards the upper funnel. So the thing we just discussed earlier, the only problem that you will often get into, it doesn't really work to move towards the upper funnel if you just use the data you currently have. So I think another thing you need to think about is how can you actually enrich the first party data that you have? Yeah? And I think one key thing here can also be content. So how can you present content to users in a systematic way and track what content people are interested in because that is the interest level that you generate on certain content pieces can also be something to enrich your customer data. You know, because if you just take the transaction data, and that is actually what you, what you also see in, in CRM emails. I mean, what is the thing that works always in CRM emails is if you do product recommendations based on the stuff that people have looked at or purchased before. That's the thing that always works. But if you try to move beyond that, then it gets hard. Yeah? And I think, and my answer for this is, I know it's not easy, but I think the only other thing you can do is start to do the same thing you've done with products with content. Yeah? So try to think of content also in a, the same way you think about products. So think about content pieces you have in a product feed type format, so in a content feed type format, that you systematically expose users to, and thereby try to find out what is not only the product interest pattern of a user, but what is also the content interest pattern of a user. I think that's, I think, at least the only, the, the, the only other way that I can think of that seems to be a natural kind of way to get better first-party data on a different dimension or a different level than just showing them product information. And that's what I mean by enrich. So systematically think about what other elements of interaction can I show to a user to get more and a deeper understanding of who are the users that are actually in front of me. Another thing where it's actually probably still a little early to say how it will work, but I'm 100% sure that this is one of the avenues that, that should be followed, is the one of the data alliances. So things like VeryMe, NetID, data cooperatives. It doesn't really matter whether it's NetID or VeryMe. It's stupid, actually, that uh, the Germans are coming up with two different data cooperatives. I think there should only be one, and we should concentrate on one. Yes, I, I think it's not good that because if you think about data alliances as a GDPR um, compliant way to share data among each other, we should actually put all the data into one basket and, and make use of it. Yeah, that, that will be a smart answer because we'll any, no matter what we do, it will be a lot worse than what Facebook and Amazon have anyway. Yeah? So we should try to do the, we should try to get the maximum data quality in, into uh, people's hands as possible. So Two data alliances is not really helpful, but still, if, if, I, if you have reached a certain size, that is definitely something I would engage with um, and try to find out what these data alliances can do for you. Because I think no matter how smart you are in terms of first-party data collection and what cool content stream you're coming up with, I think it will definitely help to share data with others. Um, uh, because I think it's an illusion, even for somebody like Zalando or somebody like Otto Group, that they will be able to generate alone data that will allow them to run a serious customer acquisition product 
based or pr uh, approach based on first party data. So I think enriching in whatever form, and that could also be something, because who, they, who should take care of these things? Yeah? Somebody has to take care of these things in the organization. And I think CRM could be a natural home for people that think about how can we actually enrich our first party data in a sensible way. Um, it could also obviously be BI. Uh, I haven't really made up my mind what's the best place for this, but somebody has to take care of it. And I think another stream, and I think that's also something where CRM could be a natural kind of owner uh, or natural driver, is what we've at least experienced, if you want to do things on YouTube or if you want to do things in all areas audience targeting, will probably not work. If you do the same kind of thing you're, we have been doing on, um, uh, on Google, etc., for a couple of years, so you show an ad, you look at the click performance, and then either it works or it doesn't work. I think if you move towards the upper funnel, what you have to think about is more thinking in user journeys, not in an attribution sense, but thinking in user journeys more in a storytelling, how can I get users through a certain kind of message funnel that is more likely to convert these users than other message funnels are. So I'm not talking about just passively measuring the user journey of people and then doing an attribution afterwards. I'm talking about an active design of which kind of message is shown to which kind of user segment, in which position, and trying to understand which kind of user funnel has a better ROI than another one. So it's really about optimizing a whole chain of contacts and a whole chain of events, and not just a single placement logic as we usually have it. Because I think if you just do that, the likelihood of being able to run a uh, yeah, high volume uh, audience targeting approach will probably not be that high. So you need this kind of storytelling content program, because otherwise, I'm pretty sure it will not um, reach a very high level in a sensible kind of way. Um, obviously, you need the proper BI to do this. Um, otherwise, uh, this whole thing will not work. And what can be the role of a CDP in this? Because I think that's also interesting, because you might argue all of that first-party data, that should be in the data warehouse, right? Because, I mean, that's where first-party data should sit. And one of the things I've always been arguing for years, and that's often violated, you, you should have the single point of truth, all user data just in one kind of bucket. And I think that still makes sense. But what you basically have to realize, and I think that's why a CDP could make sense, let me just come to the, to the last slide, and why you probably should have a coexistence of a CDP and a data warehouse, a data warehouse in most companies, even if you go to the larger ones um, and, and the ones with more money, most people don't have a data warehouse infrastructure that's real time. That's just not realistic that you have. And you probably also don't need it. Yeah? So it makes sense to have a certain portion of the user data um, uh, infrastructure that you have that's real time and that collects real time information that's able to also react in real time. And that's probably the CDP. And then you have the data warehouse where you store the information that's not necessarily uh, in need real time, and that's not necessarily also uh, collecting real time information, but just collecting that information that's real time and where you think it has some kind of value also in a persistent kind of way. Yeah? So the single point of truth stays the data warehouse, so I think that doesn't change. Yeah? But there's a complementary system that's collecting and also able to, to react to certain things in real time. And that's probably the, the CDP. And I think that's how it should all uh, work together. And I think a key thing for the CDP to be relevant also for what we discussed earlier, because if you think about what I said earlier, if you want to move outside of Facebook and if you want to move outside of Google, a normal data warehouse probably won't help you that much. Yeah? Because most data warehouse infrastructure that at least I've been exposed to will not be able to get data directly into uh, something like a DSP or something like a DMP very easily. So that is, I think, one key thing for a CDP to do, yeah? get data into real-time advertising systems. Um, and the question is whether you also need an additional DMP 
and that I haven't really made up my mind yet, to be honest. Um, but obviously that would make the whole thing more complex, and I think it also, also de depends on the situation. But I think having a CDP and a, da uh, a data warehouse infrastructure, that, that is basically the no-brainer. And about the, the role of a DMP, I haven't really made up my mind. Yeah? So uh, I've just been signaled that I should stop, and I will. Uh, so uh, let's leave that. There's some more questions, obviously. Not all things are clear. But if you have uh, some questions right now, very happy to answer them, yeah? trying to at least. And, uh, Otherwise, we'll reach a much more, or we'll come to a much uh, cooler topic than what I've just discussed. Uh, but happy to answer some questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Great presentation. It's just a couple of questions. Um, you show the customer journey in some of the touch points, just I assume it's just um, yeah. universal touch points. How do you measure success, or maybe what's your opinion of measuring success of every touch points? Because there is some kind of interaction with the, um, yeah. with the customer or with the end user. Yeah. And how do you integrate that data with the CRM technical data that you already have, and what kind of impact it has actually at the end user perception? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, how do you measure the, uh, what? It's a little bit like an attribution problem, yeah? So, um, and there's different ways to do attribution um, and, and measure the value of a certain contact. Um, what I tend to favor the most is um, that you not only look at, I mean, what we did at Rocket and what a lot of people are doing it, is like this 40, 20, 40 Badawana type logic, yeah? But that's basically, I mean, there's no real logic. I mean, there's a logic behind it, but it's arbitrary logic, yeah? It's, I mean, a lot of people are using it, but there was no real reason uh, behind it, apart from it being simple, yeah? So, um, and everybody gets it. So that's, um, uh, and it's intuitive. What I think, if you want to be more sophisticated, is and what actually Criteo is doing, to my knowledge, what they try to do is they try to do um, a kind of an engagement index per contact. So if a user stays on a website very long or stays in an app very long and engages very highly, they do some kind of indexing behind it. So they don't care so much about the sequence of the contacts, but they actually care more about uh, the engagement on that very contact. So even if the contact is like the third contact and in a Baden-Baden type logic would be really bad, yeah, that could be very good. So, and I think for, for CRM, so if you want to try to uh, find out what people are reacting on, like content, etc., yes, so there will be no conversion. But I think you can still, so I think in a CRM context and also building an intent graph per user, I think this engagement kind of logic probably makes more sense. Yeah, so, uh, and that's what I would follow. And it's also quite simple to, to implement. What you obviously need for this is you need raw data. Yeah? So, uh, on a most granular level as possible. Um, so you can use Google 360 for it. Unfortunately, just the cheap premium version for like 50, 60,000 euros, yeah? <laughs> um, or you can still obviously use WebTrack for it or Mixpanel. Uh, so I mean, there's several, there's several um, uh, things that your Econda also provides raw data, yeah? So there's several tools that provide raw data. The only problem with the raw data obviously is if you don't have a good matching of devices, yeah, you have to somehow manage the cross-device problem. Yeah. Or reduce the data, I think, as well, because if you have so, too much data, sometimes it's really hard to concentrate. I think there's too much noise in the data. Yeah. So I think the data reduction is also a very important point. That needs to keep in mind. And, and especially for CRM, it's not great, yeah, because, I mean, normally I would say if you lose people through ad blocking or whatever, for just finding out campaign performance, it's not so relevant, yeah, because even if you just track 70% of the users, I think the relative kind of messages you get from the data still stay the same, yeah? So, and that's why I would not always, like tracking 90% of the users or 80 is not per se bad, yeah? In a CRM context, it is bad because in the CRM context, you want obviously everyone. Um, so, but that's either, I wouldn't know how to solve that in a, in a proper way, to be honest, yeah? I think there's no magic trick around it. Uh, so I think the best thing you can do is uh, try to get as much raw data as possible. Use, if you have an app, use things like adjust. Yeah, to get some data from there. What we try to do to, to master this uh, cross-device problem is we use cross-device logic from, from uh, Facebook. Yeah? So we use the number of cross-device conversions that are tracked in Facebook and apply it to everything else. Obviously, that's not correct, yeah? but uh, that's the best that I would 
No, yeah? and unless you're Google or Facebook, <laughs> I guess there's no way that you can know. Yeah? But that's also why this data alliance thing can be so interesting also, because if you have a good data alliance in place, they would also be able, if you, if you would have like the, the cross-device reach of Zalando and Otto and Lufthansa and you know, uh, uh, Payback, mm -hmm. if you would have all of their cross-device reaches together, then it could become interesting again. Yeah? But then uh, you already have the problem doing this on a GDPR-compliant way. I don't actually know how they will be able to do that. Yeah? So, yeah. Thank Sorry, you. long answer, yeah. but yeah. it's Thank a complex no, topic. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, thanks for your talk, first of all. Sure. Um, I've got a question. We, uh, we realized what you said on one of your first slides. It's not very smart to acquire the customer again and again via GAFA, mm -hmm. but instead build your own platform. And we are mm -hmm. in the, like trying to transition from a normal block mm -hmm. to a, yeah, your own platform. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been looking this up for the past few months. Are there any like, best practices or like, even good examples, maybe in your portfolio uh, companies even, in companies that did that switch as well and do well? So who started as like, a normal content business mm -hmm. and then did a switch and uh, yeah, transformed to a platform where users are active and where you have a good login experience? Or are there tips for that transition as which, uh, yeah, just struggling with that uh, mm -hmm. transition? So we actually have not invested in any content businesses, to be not honest. Not yet. Not yet, yeah. Uh, which is not saying that I don't like content businesses. I just don't, we just don't know a lot about it. I yeah, just don't understand it that well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the thing is CRM cannot solve it per se, yeah? So I think you need to, I can, I can give you an analogy if that helps. I mean, what we, the way we think about it in e-commerce, yeah, is we move B2B, yeah? So because there you often have more repeat purchase likelihood. So if you, for example, take a Lampenwelt, which is a market leader in uh, lightning equipment, yeah, or also Kfz-Teile, yeah, if you do a Kfz-Teile business, which is a big business, I mean, you can look it up in the uh, Bundesanzeiger, it's like 180 million euro business, so it's big, but the only way you can grow it profitably is, uh, is in B2B, yeah? because if you just have people that buy a windshield once a month, uh, once a year, and uh, a tire every second year or fourth year, no way to, to get profitable. So I think in, in e-commerce we think about, or also in travel or so, we would think about how can you um, expand the assortment yeah, that you even have the chance to have a repeat purchase kind of behavior. Yeah? So I think in your sense, it probably also makes sense to do a newsletter. Yeah? I mean, or some kind of Facebook group or LinkedIn group to re-engage people over and over and over again. I mean, that's also, if you look at OMR, that's probably the, a very good example for this online marketing rock stars, I mean, they've, they've spoken today. They've also introduced paid products yeah, to get user data. I mean, their paid reports are a major source to the revenue already. Huh? But if I really build a platform, because for me, like Omar, it seems like you, may, you can kind of like log in, but they don't have like build a real community with online marketers. That's true, but I think the community piece is also the hardest piece, yeah, because uh, it's like, I think providing high-quality uh, content products that people are willing to pay for, you can systematically do. I think if you're able to really reach a kind of natural activity community status and also maintain it, that's just very hard. And the, qu and the, the, the other problem I have with community is the moment you lose coolness yeah, of, of the community, you're basically like a fashion brand that's out of style. Yeah, there's no comeback. Uh, you're just... Yeah, you're, you're, just on a, you're just a falling knife, basically. And I think that's why I would always think about, if you look also at high snobiety, for example, yeah, that's why high snobiety goes into e-commerce, yeah, because that is a way that's more systematic. Because if high snobiety loses its coolness, which it probably won't because they're so cool, uh, then um, you know, there's no way they can act. Uh, and I think that's why I would also um, use uh, the reach that you have to go beyond uh, just content and introduce a paid product if that's possible, like OMR. Um, diversify the content mix. Do events. Yeah. So I mean, that's if you if you if you if you see what OMR is doing, it's probably not a platform because it's still missing the community element. But I think they would if they would now be doing it, you know, like provide an exchange, they would probably be in a much better position than they would have been five years ago. Yeah. So I mean, now they could very likely do it. I don't know whether Philip plans it, but I think he. he 
very credibly could. And I think the likelihood of a, uh, of a natural community activity now emerging on OMR is higher than, than ever. Yeah? So, and uh, I think if you would start now doing an OMR-like community for online marketeers, chances that this actually works is not that high. Yeah? Um, so um, I, I don't know your product, obviously, and I don't know your position, but I think that's what I would also question, whether you are already in the position, because I think becoming a platform is just the highest thing or the most difficult thing to, to become. Yeah? And uh, um, the question is just whether you are already in the position to, to realistically achieve this. Yeah? But let's probably take this offline in, in, uh, in a minute and to understand a little bit better what you are currently doing. Okay, yeah? thank you. Sure? <laughs> okay, there won't be off the stage. That's good. Um, thanks once more for the talk. Um, I do have a question regarding the fourth action stream that you suggested, yeah. like moving away from traditional creatives into the journey, into attribution, yeah. and from there on to the, the storytelling approach. Yeah. I think this is an extremely hard to accomplish task, so uh, my question would be, is there any good best practices out there in the market that you would recommend as of right now? I mean, who's working on these kind of things is, is Opinary, for example. I mean, it's also a portfolio company of ours. Yeah? I mean, that's, uh, they're, they're trying, trying to solve this for, for publishers also. Um, and I think what other company you might look at, which is moving into a direction like this, um, is Smartly. Yeah? So the, the Facebook advertising tool that has been the first one doing things with dynamic product ads and supporting dynamic product ads, they're also trying uh, to do the sim uh, similar thing for content. Yeah? So, and what I would try to do, if you have a business uh, that is smartly, in the smartly sphere of um, um, basically activity, I would start talking to them. Um, and I would also, if you have a good Facebook uh, connection, um, they have several examples because, I mean, the Red Bulls and people like that, they are working on these kind of things, yeah? So, or Netflix is a very good example of this. I mean, Netflix uh, is producing segmented trailers for the same shows depending on which user segment they're targeting, yeah? And the, the only way that you can do that is obviously having tools like a Products Up, yeah, uh, for content, yeah? Because if you think about it, it's exactly the same problem, yeah, as, as oh, not exactly, but it's, it's a similar problem as what you are currently doing with the product feed. You have to start getting into this logic with content. Um, and, but I, Netflix is probably the best example. I know it's like a, a company that spends uh, three billion on advertising is slightly bigger than yours probably. It's not, it's not really the easiest thing to copy. I, I understand that. But it's um, um, supposedly they're not doing that with a lot of people and solve it uh, with uh, technology. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure Wish is also doing something uh, in that direction. Also pretty hard, also spending more than two billion. Yeah? But uh, I mean, the big players need to uh, have like some kind of advantage. But I think that's at least uh, some companies I would look at to get ideas. Yeah? But I, I also don't know how to do it. I just, you know, it's always easy to raise the question and say that uh, you should, guys should be working on it. Um, it's a lot harder actually to, to solve it. Yeah? I didn't claim that I know the answer. Okay, otherwise, I would say we yeah, move to Sebastian. Yeah?